This is a Relay Project. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Real Talk. Coming up in about a half hour's time, we're going to take a look at the state of journalism in Canada. What's happening? If you're paying attention to the layoffs as of late, you're seeing them happen across the country. And if you pay extra close attention to this industry or have done over the past 10 years, you're going, well, nothing's new about that. Tis the season. Tis the time of year. Tell us something we didn't know. But what are the stakes here? Why is this happening? Can we all acknowledge that fact-finding, that truth-telling, that story-sharing has its value in society, that it's important? And if so, should we be sounding the alarm right now? Uh, There's a lot of talk about external factors, about ownership groups, and of course, You can get into that in a bunch of different angles, and that's exactly what we're going to do this morning when we check in with our guests. That's coming up again right around half an hour from now. Aaron Miller is going to join us, the CEO of IndieGraph, and Jen Hassam, the publisher of Press Progress. And we'll lead off with the story in just a couple of minutes that I suspect the technical producer of this show is going to absolutely hate, and that is that Canada exports more than $20 million a year in live horses for consumption in international markets, in particular sashimi. The federal government, the prime minister, has promised Canadians that they would take steps to end the horse slaughter, but so far that hasn't happened. Jessica Scott Reed is an investigative journalist, a freelancer that covers stories of animal welfare out of Winnipeg. She's been on the show before and she makes her return in just a couple of minutes. Are you bracing yourself for oh, this I one? I love her. I love Jess. Yeah, she does a lot of good work. Amazing. She's a fearless Amazing. storyteller. She's she's talked about the the welfare of animals on farms, the welfare of animals in transit. She sees a lot of blowback to her stories from Big Ag. And I suspect we're going to get some emails after we talk to Jess, and that's fine. We want to find all the sides of a relevant story and understand exactly what it means to us. That's the whole point of this show. So Jessica Scott Reed coming up in just a minute. Of course, we'll head out to Jasper. We've got my Jasper memories on this Wednesday Uh, and a great email. You ready for that? We're talking about like spas and relaxing today. I need it. I need it. I know. Why don't we just, we should be doing the show from a hot tub this morning. And Cameron wrote us a great email following our conversation yesterday about, about whether or not anybody can meet in the middle anymore. And I think maybe there was some confusion You know, here's what happens. You have a big conversation about something, right? Yesterday, we committed about 40 minutes to it, about taking some of the big stories, making news in politics and in real life, the everyday life. And we wondered aloud whether or not we were all too entrenched in camps or whether or not we can actually share different thoughts, whether or not we can exchange ideas. And then, of course, we push it out on social media with promotional clips, and we ask questions like, can we meet in the middle anymore? And a lot of the responses were like, well, I'm sorry, but I can't meet in the middle with Nazis. And I kind of went, well, yeah, that's not exactly what we were getting at. We, we were more talking about, like, you know, NDPs and conservatives or liberals and conservatives or or rural and urban folks or or folks that, that grew up in eastern Canada versus western Canada or or maybe folks that, that cheer for certain hockey teams. No, we don't have to drag that into there. We know that nobody's going to get along there. But you get the point. Cameron's got a great observation about where that is exploration went yesterday and where he'd like to see it move forward. Cameron, of course, wrote in to talk at ryanjesperson.com. I'm just realizing as well, it's February 1st, which means we're in a February, position. February. Yeah, Febru- oh, oh, you didn't like how I said it? <laughs> yeah. We're in a position to hand out another Real Talk Studio mug Amazing. for an email of nice. the month. And, and so we'll get into that as well. Plus, we've got our live auction going on twitter yeah a bit of a slow start not gonna lie an original from louis lavoie uh an incredible painter if you're listening on the podcast let me describe this for you this is an original masterpiece depicting a pond hockey scene 
Uh, it takes you right back to those wonderful days of childhood. You can hear the skate blades carving up the ice. Well, Lewis has painted this and donated it to the Real Talk Pond Hockey Classic that goes this Saturday. Of course, all proceeds going to charity through the Canadian Progress Club St. Albert. Uh, it's going to be Kids Sport St. Albert, which removes, we hope, barriers to sport for kids, in particular financial barriers, provides equipment so kids can play sports, and then uncles and aunts at large as well, which is a longstanding organization I'm sure you're familiar with if you'd like to place a bid on that painting it'll wrap up saturday at three o'clock mountain time you can check out my twitter profile at ryan jesperson we have it on our instagram stories as well jessica scott reed in 90 seconds i wanted to let you know that coming up on friday our real talk roundtable presented by urban timber is going to meet the founders of the magazine club They've taken a look at polling that shows that the majority of of women in in corporate scenarios, the majority of women in business don't actually feel as though they can speak out and actually, well, completely be themselves, share their ideas with confidence around boardroom tables and elsewhere. So we're going to find out what the Magazine Club is doing about it. Urban Timber presents our Real Talk Roundtable every Friday. Speaking of tables, I mean, this team is the best in the business. They built and delivered our table they'd love to do the same for you whether that's a living room a family room a boardroom a side table a coffee table and heck while we're at it why not custom wood flooring what about wood paneling what about shelving if you can dream it up whether it's a kitchen a living room a bedroom a boardroom urban timber does it best with their reclaimed wood some of it literally hundreds of years old. Nobody does it like Urban Timber. You can check them out in their new West Edmonton showroom Saturdays from 10 to 4 or go see them online right now at urbantimber.ca. Uh, sounding the alarm for those of you lovebirds out there that m- maybe leave things to the last minute. Friesen Brothers has you covered for Valentine's Day charcuterie uh, boards. Uh, they've got the sweet. They've got the savory. Of course, you can get into the cheese and the meats and the pickles and the olives or maybe a dessert charcuterie. Oh, and by the way, if you're hearing this today at all 16 Alberta locations, it is February 1st. That means it's 15% off all grocery purchases at Friesen Brothers over $75 from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. 15% off today. Friesen Brothers is Alberta owned and Alberta grown. And Athabasca University wants to remind you that this is a perfect time of year to pursue that dream of bettering yourself and maybe putting yourself in a in a more advantageous position to get that dream job you've always wanted. You know, there's barriers, aren't there? It seems like for everybody into the adult years when it comes to clearing up your schedule for post-secondary education you're going well what about obligations i have to my aging parents or or to my kids that are in school what about that vacation we have coming up or or, or what about my current part or full-time job where they need me right now athabasca university has built its entire model around flexibility to learn at your own pace on a schedule that suits your lifestyle You can learn more about what it means to study at Athabasca University online at AthabascaU.ca. Well, a recent piece in Canada's national paper, The Globe and Mail, uh, caught our attention. Of course, it's a, a headline that jumps right off the page. Horses are still being exported for slaughter. Will Trudeau take action? How many Canadians actually realize that this is happening? And it's happening frequently. Horses headed in particular to Asian markets to be, well, consumed for sashimi and other delicacies. But of course, that doesn't fly with everybody. The United States, for example, has banned the export of horses for food. Canada's federal government has said that it will, but it hasn't as of yet. The piece in the Globe penned by two names you're bound to recognize. Legendary Canadian singer-songwriter Jan Arden and Jessica Scott Reed, a journalist who joins us, returns, I should say, to the show uh, from her home in Winnipeg. It's nice to see your face again. Thanks for making time for us. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, so this is a promise, I guess, that the that the Prime Minister made uh, back in 2021, and, and the timing of it was pretty interesting. I'll let you tell the story. The Conservatives have, have, have had just reached out to voters on a front that you know is going to land. They said, we're going to close down poppy mills nothing cuter than puppies and the day later justin trudeau had an announcement to make 
Yeah, the timing seemed serendipitous, perhaps, that everybody was talking about animal welfare all of a sudden, which is something already difficult to get on, uh, you know, election platforms. But here we were, suddenly, Justin Trudeau was promising something that was being brought to light by grassroots activism, I think perhaps for the first time ever. So it was to ban the live export of horses from Canada to Japan for slaughter, which is something advocates and activists have been fighting for for years. Uh, it really enticed, I think, a lot of compassionate voters. Uh, and here we are now, what, 16 months later, uh, he's been elected and that promise has not yet been fulfilled. So l- let me ask you a question that's not intended to be insensitive, but we try to ask the tough questions on the show. What separates horses from other animals that we export for slaughter? Why is this such an issue? I'm not sure that we actually put, you know, cows on planes on Korean air flights to travel across the world for slaughter in another country. Uh, Also, we have to talk about the fact that in Canada, horses are more so considered pets. You know, I, of course, would argue that most animals are the same in this way. But I think most Canadians would be generally upset to know that animals that we generally don't eat here in this country outside of perhaps Quebec are being put on planes and shipped across the world to be uh, chopped up into sashimi. You've talked a lot about the transport of animals in in different industries, and I want to get into that in particular through the cold weather months in a moment with you. But but as as far as you can, or as best as you can, can you explain to us what what the travel looks like for these horses that are that are packed into crates? Yeah, I think to to start off, we have to acknowledge the fact that in Canada we have feedlots where we farm horses specifically to become meat. We are one of the biggest meat producers, horse meat producers in the world, which I don't think a lot of Canadians know. So a lot of these horses start off on feedlots in Alberta, and then they are transported in open-sided metal trucks, like all livestock in Canada, to either airports in Alberta or here in Manitoba, where I am. So that's already a, a massive amount of travel. And then they are uh, loaded up into these crates. They're crammed two to four at a time. Uh, They're often put on tarmacs for a long time. This all happens under the cover of night. Uh, And it doesn't matter the weather. It can be plus 30 or minus 30. This is going on at airports. Uh, And then they're loaded up onto these Korean air flights. And they're flown all the way to Japan. Uh, These travels, uh, travel days, travel conditions can last for legally up to 28 hours. Of course, those times are being reported by the industry itself. So advocates are often uh, skeptical about those limitations. But imagine you've been on an an eight hour flight across the ocean and feeling how uncomfortable that is. Imagine being forced to stand in a crate with other animals um, for that amount of time. Uh, Canadians oftentimes when we talk about our legislation sometimes we like to insulate ourselves and and we'll bristle when we see what's happening in the United States we'll say well we're not the United States and other times we'll see countries like the U.S. or or maybe the U.K. or other countries maybe Japan or or Sweden that we would see as as other progressives uh, or or other you know sort of a global leaders in policy and we would we would say well we share values with countries like that maybe Australia and others and, and And the United States in this circumstance, I think, is a relevant example. And it's almost shocking when you look at when Congress passed this Horse Slaughter Prevention Act that you write about. It was 2006, like coming up on 20 years ago. What can you tell us about what was happening in the U.S. around that time and what led to Congress passing that and and the impact that it had and, and maybe how that might land with Canadians that are potentially just hearing about this for the first time? Yeah, it really was about public pressure to close these horse meat slaughterhouses in the U.S. that led to this bill being passed. Uh, And since then, I don't think a lot of people also realize that it's not that the horse meat industry in the U.S. has ended. It's definitely slowed down because of not having the infrastructure to kill the animals on site. But there are also horse feedlots in the U.S., but instead they're shipping them here. They're shipping them to Mexico and they're shipping them to Canada. So we are now slaughtering America's horses and exporting that meat. And also on top of that, we've just found out through an access to information request, um, the Canadian Horse Defense Coalition, the advocacy group that does all this work, they found out that just recently a new rule was put in place that American horses, once they stay in Canada for six months, can also now be exported to Japan for sashimi. So American horses are now also having to endure this horrific fate. So although the U.S. has made progress in no longer slaughtering horses on site, they're just 
giving that dirty work to us. Yeah, I was going to say that, that that sounds like just getting our border services and RCMP to arrest the Huawei, the Huawei executive in on, on British Columbian soil as opposed to American soil. We're doing the dirty work. So so the federal government has recognized that this is an issue, right? Uh, I mean, like you, you talk about this promise that was made on September 1st of 2021, the liberals publicly promising to ban the export of live horses for slaughter. Who's the minister responsible? As far as you can tell, where is it at right now? And, and what do you suspect the holdup might be? Is there industry pressure here at play? Yeah, so we have our agricultural minister, Mary Claude Bibeau, who's been mandated since that. So that was another point within this story that advocates got very excited about. So the promise was made. We're all sitting and waiting. We all made our votes. And then the mandate letter came through and we were like, OK, that's that's for sure, meaning it's going to happen. And it's been very it's been months and months. As of October, I think it was something like twenty three hundred horses still being sent to Japan for slaughter since this uh, promise was made. So nothing's happened so far. And to the Globe and Mail, uh, the minister made a, a statement saying that they are uh, you know, actively uh, considering this, that they are talking to stakeholders. I mean, who are the stakeholders? The stakeholders are the farmers. So why are we considering what they have to say when the ban has already been promised? So, so far, it's been completely stalled. And there's a lot of concern on our end, uh, advocates and activists who think that this was actually just a, a voting strategy and not a, a real promise. Uh, I saw something here on our live chat. If you're just tuning in, maybe listening on the Mixler live streaming audio app that's presented by California Closets. We're talking to Jessica Scott Reed. I saw something in our live chat that I had to fact check. Uh, you know, so, some people are saying, well, hang on a second. Like Darcy says, they eat horse meat in Sweden. And then Michael says, I remember Ikea was caught using horse meat in their meatballs a few years ago. He says, not at Canadian locations. I thought, no, that can't possibly be true. Well, well of course it is. It turns out it is. Real talkers know what's up. It was 10 years ago, February 25th. 5th of 2013 authorities say they detected horse meat in ikea meatballs in in europe culturally like when you look around the world who's the outlier the the the, the cultures that do eat horse meat or the, or the ones that don't can you get a sense i guess i guess it depends where you're standing when you're asking the question i mean here in canada and quebec uh horse meat is is consumed uh when i lived in switzerland for a time on menus it said horse meat often, and in fact, it said Canadian horse meat. That really? was the delicacy on the Swiss menus was Canadian horse meat. So I guess it depends where you're standing when you're when you're asking that question. I think the majority of Canadians would consider horses companion animals. And the fact is, too, that we're exporting to Japan draft horses. So those are the horses that we like to tell the story that Canada as a country was built on the backs of draft horses. And now look what we're doing to them. So I think as Canadians, um, there's a story there that, that doesn't all pan out in the end. Why are we treating the horses that you know built our country in this way? Yeah, yeah. Pe- people are wrestling with this one, which I appreciate. It's why we do this show, Jess. You know, Kathy says, I will, you know, it's a cultural difference, right? She says, you know, a lot of Asian nations will eat dogs regularly. Some cultures eat bugs. I mean, there's a ton of them that do uh, and have no problem with it. I, I-, I remember having uh, flatbreads that was made with uh, cricket flour, protein or, you know, flour that was made out of crickets fascinating stuff anyway cactus sheriff says that's exactly what it is humane conditions aside there's no difference to cultures who need protein sources to feed growing populations i wonder if that's part of it jess right there's an international market as you write about it what was it over the past five years correct my math if i'm wrong almost 100 million dollars of horses yeah, it's, exported it's the last in these markets. Five years, over 14,000 horses we've exported. Those are the live horses we've exported to the tune of $93 million. Mm. So it's it's a massive industry. I think the, I think the reason why this conversation why it becomes, you know, a political issue is because uh here in Canada that's just not how we consider horses. And 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 I think that's okay. It's not something that the majority of us eat. So why is it that we are killing these animals just to sell somewhere else? Yeah. And then also the condition standards are different too. We are concerned about what happens to these horses once they land in Japan, right? There's there's not the same uh, animal welfare standards that we have in Canada. So it's not that they're just landing and being slaughtered right away. They're going to feedlots there too. And then what happens to them? 
I'm looking at this uh, petition that's online. I'm, I'm curious to know, can you tell us, before we get into that, actually, your, your relationship with da- Jan Arden, uh, how did that come about? I, there's a whole bunch of people in our chat right now that have heard her live in concert, and they're all saying that she's been bringing it up on stage. It's mm-hmm. obviously, I don't think she's bringing up 15 different causes on stage, so it obviously resonates with her. How did the two of you meet? How did you connect? And, and she's not here with us this morning. You, I know you worked on that. She's on tour right now, but, but why do you think that this is so important to her? Yeah, over the last few years, Jan has really taken this up as a personal um, issue. She does bring it up at her shows. She created the hashtag horse shit. Uh, there's a whole line of T-shirts. So Jan is a, is a Calgary girl, right? She still lives outside of the city. She's a horse girl. I think she was a marshal at the Stampede at one point, the, the parade marshal. So she really cares about horses. And when it was brought to her a few years ago, I think by the Canadian Horse Defense Coalition, that this issue was happening, that we're such big producers of horse meat. And then, of course, the export um, issue that really bothers her. She got pissed. And when Jan Arden gets pissed, you're going to hear about it. So I've interviewed her over uh, the last um, year and a half or so, just before the election and after the election. And she's been very sort of... um, okay with the liberal government taking their time you know very hopeful that you know okay like they made the promise it's not happening it's time to pick up now now she's really mad so we worked together on this piece Uh, i think it's about the fourth or fifth one that i've worked on with her this one we actually co-authored uh because she was ready to use her own voice in the media and and say let's get this done already Hmm. the first time you and i spoke it was a a terrestrial radio interview and that was about five years ago and it was right after you had published a piece in the globe and mail canada must do better to protect freezing animals in transport we're not just talking about horses here uh can you take us into this story the reason i want to establish the time stamp uh is that i'm curious to know whether or not you've noticed has anything changed in the last five years here what's the reality check on how animals are transported in canada yeah there has been a change um a couple of years ago they updated the time length um, that the amount that the amount of time animals of different species can travel from you know for farm to slaughterhouse or from farm to farm. Uh, and I remember I just saw a headline in the Toronto Star after that happened that said the times were updated and no one was happy about it. So farmers weren't happy about it uh, and animal activists weren't happy about it because the change wasn't that great. So at this point, depending on species, um, animals in Canada considered livestock can travel between 28 and 36 hours for the most part on these open-sided metal trucks that have uh, no climate control and there's no laws or rules about temperature above or below which the animals can travel so regardless if if it's minus 30 or plus 30 uh, animals are being transported to slaughter every single day across canada and it's very different from standards in other countries Uh, in the in europe for example when i lived there you could see the trucks they were outfitted with these climate controls and fans and heaters. And there's rules about the temperature above and below which animals can be transported. And here we just don't have that. And yet our country is so vast and our climate is so extreme. So on cold days like this, I know a lot of us uh, advocates are thinking about those pigs and chickens stuck in those metal open sided trucks without heat. Is it tough to get the average Canadian to really, truly care about this kind of stuff? Like, does, does it feel like an uphill climb for you all the time? Depends on the day, Ryan. Uh, it's um, I think issues like this, talking about horses, really gets people thinking about, oh, they get enraged about horses, and then it makes them consider, well, wait, why is a cow any different? I think talking on days where it's really cold like this, or on days when it's hot enough that we're calling police because dogs are being locked in hot cars, when we can talk about those sorts of cross-species conversations where the public will get enraged about one issue, and then you ask, well, why not about pigs and chickens? And I think those are really those really resonate with a lot of the public. Um, and I'm and I'm always trying <laughs> to get mm. that to happen. I think I already know the answer to this question. I, I, I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this question. But Mike wonders if you're if you would also be against you. I mean, you're an interesting position, right? Because you're a, you're a, you're an independent. You're a freelance journalist and and you, you wear your heart on your sleeve, right? Like you would you describe your your. your you're a storyteller, but you're also an advocate, right? I mean, yeah. you, may, you may go so far as to say you're an activist um, if the label fits, and I don't think that that's a pejorative, right? You, you, you give a damn 
And yeah. so, you know, so, so you you know, your journalism oftentimes will infuse your personal opinion, uh, which is fine. I think as long as you're wearing your heart on your sleeve. So Mike says, I mean, would Jess be also against horses being used in chuck wagon races and rodeos? He says there seems to be a, a number of deaths every year across the province during local events. I think I might already know the answer. Yeah. Yeah. Google me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and see, here's where, Hey, we were talking yesterday about people as sharing different opinions and getting along. Jess, I grew up attending chuck wagon races. I'm a Calgary kid. My summers included the rodeo and I love the rodeo. I love it. And I also get why people hate it. And mm-hmm. I think it's important. I'm not afraid to have these conversations. I know that you're not either. Yeah, I think it's important, especially because we seem to be at kind of a cultural cusp, right, where people are having these conversations, um, rules are being changed, cultures are shifting, especially in our food system, as well as in animal entertainment. Look at what happened with the circus, right? We look at what happened with the use of wild animals in circuses. So things can change once knowledge is disseminated. So I think things like rodeo and chuck wagons, not only are we waiting for those headlines that the inevitable horse is going to die due to this horrific chuck wagon um, entertainment. But then we're having conversations about why does this exist to begin with? And is this how we should be treating animals at all? And for what purpose? Why are we taking is what's the risk versus reward in this consideration? And so I think the fact that we've had that conversation about about circuses means that we can move on to other things now uh, as a progressive society should. Hmm. Um, I want to let people know if this is really resonating with them and, and you can point them in a different direction as well. But if they want to do something right this minute, uh, th- this petition uh, created by Canadian icon uh, Jan Arden, who we've just discussed, uh, you can find it at Winnipeg Humane Society CA or just Google Horse Exportation Canada petition and you'll find it there. Um, Jess, before we go, before we thank you for your time, I want to just run through some headlines here. Uh, I know you've seen them all, uh, you know. Uh, here on swineweb.com. I'm not sure that's the most objective source. <laughs> Swine, <laughs> swineweb.com. Jesus. Well, Johnny, what? I mean, I'm working on something here. I'm getting us to a point, but at least I'm divulging my sources. I'm not saying it's on CNN, but on, on swineweb.com, we see a story, the fake meat fad is fading. Uh, here's one at cbc.ca. The plant-based faux meat is proving to have lots of sizzle, but very little steak. And here at pressreader.com, you can read a story. Plant-based meat, just a passing fad. What do you make of these stories in this coverage? What do you think the reality is? Yeah, I think it w- it's been talked about in Bloomberg, so we can go with that one, okay? There you go. It's aside from SwineWeb. SwineWeb.com. Um, you haven't spent a lot of time on that website? I've never heard no, of it, but I'm definitely going to so look weird. at it That's so weird. I would have th- thought you wake up, you check your Instagram, you check SwineWeb.com. SwineWeb. Ch- yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's been making the media headlines probably started with Bloomberg and trickling down to SwineWeb. So it's a lot of people are talking about it. Um, I think that the, the difficult thing that's being that's not being talked about is that beyond meat you know the maker of the you know holier than thou god given plant-based meat i mean i love it uh it it makes up like 14 percent of like this massive four billion dollar plant-based um food industry so the fact that we have you know beyond meat and impossible meat having lower than expected sales during this time i mean it's a hard time to be a food company for anyone right now, right? Food inflation and, and and grocery shopping is is a difficult time. I think because of having the introduction of plant based products of this type right before the COVID nineteen pandemic started, it was not great timing. So I'd call it more growing pains than a passing fad. Um, we always talk about veganism as you know celebrities giving up being vegan. You don't give up ethics and values, right? You give up a diet. But I think those people who are really invested in trying to reduce their carbon footprint, to reduce the harm they cause upon animals and earth, uh, and to maybe eat a little less saturated fat are probably not going anywhere when it comes to picking the impossible Whopper at Burger King instead of the regular Whopper. Johnny? Have you ever, have you two ever met, Jess, have you ever met the producer, have you met Johnny we're, we're before Twitter, Johnny we're, Hicks? We're Twitter, Twitter friends, we follow you. Are okay. we Twitter yeah, friends? Yeah. You got, you oh, got, shoot. You guys, you guys, would, she's like, are we? She's got a lot of followers, you know, what? but no, you guys would get a lot, you guys are peas in a pod. What, yeah. what do you make oh, of good. those, what do you guys, first of all, Johnny, you have your paid membership to swineweb.com? I have do, you, yes. Have you paid your monthly dues <laughs> for swineweb.com? What do you, what do you make of the story? Oh, uh, the plant-based meats? Yeah, yeah. 
I think I think I agree with her. I think it's like growing pains and everything. I mean, the meat market goes up and down too. But I mean, you can't argue that there's not a market for it. Yeah. I mean, everyone I know is eating, and that's the thing. I think it's a few companies who are kind of have the majority stake right now, and some of them aren't doing the best job at yeah. running their companies. Is all it is. Yeah, Jess. I've you know I've seen some interesting things. Like I think even what what lands in our own backyard. My youngest brother Jonas uh, made a move, and he's he would say he would he would tell you he's plant based, not truly vegan, but he's pretty close to vegan. But at least for sure vegetarian. Um, so there are people that make those lifestyle changes or like sort of like the all inclusive change, if you want to call it that. And then I see a lot of people, which I, I bet might be uh, the majority of that potential market, uh, which would be people that, that are just in introducing more diversity into their diet. Like in, in so many ways, as somebody might come back, cut back on on red meat. And I don't I don't think it's a slight or an insult or a threat. Uh, to friends of mine that are working in ag, that are working in beef in particular, or, or you know, or other uh, animal proteins, but a lot of people, in in so many ways, as you're cutting back on whiskey, you're cutting back on wine, or introducing a bit more exercise, or maybe eating less ice cream during the week. I mean, unless it's Dairy Queen of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park, obviously. But other than that, um, people that are just making healthy choices i think that there's a huge opportunity there and, and i wonder if it's just more like and and i don't invoke the word lightly there's still a bit of a stigma around it yeah there's a name uh, often we call these people flexitarians sure. or reducitarians and i think ever since we've really we've really cracked the egg open about how much animal agriculture impacts the climate people have been looking for ways to reduce their impact in that way, as well as the health issues of, around learning what we've learned about uh, red meats and dairy consumption. But I mean, making a, a plant-based diet, your lifestyle can cut your eco impact, your, your water footprint, your uh, carbon footprint by like half. It's a lot. So as an individual action, if you don't want to just wait for your government to make massive changes, it's uh, it's a really easy thing that you can do as as just an individual person, and having products like the Impossible Whopper, or the Beyond Burger at A and W makes these these things much easier. Jessica Scott Reed is a freelance journalist, uh, journalist and uh, an animal advocate, uh, regularly covering animal and food systems topics for media. You've probably read her work in the Globe and Mail. That's what we're talking about today. The Toronto Star, the Winnipeg Free Press, and many other publications. A good friend of this show always gets us thinking. It's Thank nice you. to see you again, Jess. Thanks for doing this. Thank you so much for having me, as always. Yep, you bet. You can find Jess on Twitter, of course, from our official account at Real Talk RJ. We let you know every morning the handles of the guests that are going to be join us, uh, joining us so you can connect with them if you'd like to follow up or learn more okay. about the subject matter. Uh, people asking r great questions. I love, yeah, I love uh, you know, the chat. On, yeah. on the live chat right now, people are saying, for example, I think it was Mark that was saying, okay, so so horses, no, but octopus, yes. Yeah. Um, and, and, and let's acknowledge there, there are cultural implications here. Obviously, I think that that's the biggest one um in, you know to some people there are ethical implications to mm -hmm. other people uh quite frankly a stake is a stake is a stake yeah it's so complicated here because like we know certain things and farmers i know they're on the chat they'll agree with me like it takes less water it takes less energy to grow grains and vegetables than it does to raise cattle like you, we just know that but at the same time you've got like developing nations where you know they can't plant crops at the mass production rate that we do. So they're relying on food animals for protein. So this is very complicated. There's no right answer. And I like how you called her like an advocate and a, kind of an activist. And it's kind of like what all plant-based people are nowadays. You, huh. know, you know, people say like vegans, they love to tell you they're vegan, but it's hard not to when you go out and someone's like, have a burger and you're like, oh, I'll just have this. And they're like, why? And then they always want to debate you on why. And I hate it. I would rather we just all eat and they're like, oh, you don't eat meat? Cool. Yep. I would rather not talk about the issues. Yeah. You're a farm guy. You grew up in farming. Your family's I mean, in ish, it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. Dairy and yep. whatever. Yep. Do we ever argue here about food? Do we ever are sit no, here? No, but I'm and, not the type to argue about it. But I'm just saying like... It, it, you know what I can, and someone's comparing this in the chat, and I appreciate it. Um, someone's comparing it to folks that, that may make the decision. To, I don't think people really use the phrase anymore, but to teetotal or to live an alcohol free lifestyle, mm. it's a little bit similar too, right? Like you think of some of the. I mean, it's not it's 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 not apples and apples here, but but you look at the cultural implications around alcohol. You look at how we market alcohol. I mean, you know, on February twelfth, you know, billions of people are going to watch the Super Bowl, and you watch the advertising around the Super Bowl, or you watch. 
how we treat, you know, when you're asking people to meet up, you know, you want to meet for a glass of wine, should mm-hmm. we meet up for happy hour? There's just alcohol is so woven into our culture mm-hmm. that when somebody makes a decision, whether it's for religious reasons, health reasons, you know, personal family reasons, whatever it is uh, to move away from alcohol, it's a challenge for them. It's difficult. I mean, for a lot of people that are in those that first trimester of pregnancy and they're, sure. they, they got their fingers crossed because maybe they've lost a baby before. And so they're not telling people they're pregnant, but they're they're not drinking. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's difficult for people that have to navigate that minefield of not drinking. Yeah, and, it, and maybe it's the same way a little bit. I think it totally is. When we're out and someone says, hey, I'm not drinking or whether, whatever, I just let it go. Like, who cares? There could be a million reasons why. From the simplest, like they're not feeling good today to maybe they have some stuff going on in their life they're trying to change. So. Yeah. And I think it's the same thing with food nowadays. Someone in the chat said, just let people eat what they want. You know, when I started out with this, my wife obviously is a lot louder than me about these issues and arguments. But me, I'm just like, let people live. If you want to discuss things, I'll discuss them. Yeah. But I would rather we just go out and you let me order what I want and you order what you want. And neither of us put force any opinions on each other. We just eat and talk about something else. Right. Yeah. But I I I give big up and big props to Jess because she's always out there advocating because there is one thing I do think, and I know people are going to tear me apart, but I think animals, well, we're all animals, but food animals especially, they're kind of like the last oppressed beings on earth that we're fine with oppressing. Like, I feel like we care more about bees than we do. Oh, the bees are disappearing, but like chickens, cows. Well, people only care that bees are disappearing because it impacts humans. Exactly. Right? Nobody cares that <laughs> bees are disappearing because it impacts bees. Yeah. Right. Nobody cares that. Uh, and, I, and I don't even mean this. I mean, gosh, it's too soon. Mm-hmm. We, were, we were celebrating yesterday uh, following your what's her name? Nana, Nara, Kara, 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 Kara mm-hmm. your polar bear. Yeah. And uh, I was going to say nobody cares about the polar bears, but but maybe some people do. But do we care about them enough to stop burning styrofoam in mm-hmm. our campfires? But it's I, just, I don't know. It's strange. And someone said in the chat as well. And you know this. You're a big pet guy. Your pets are like part of you. Right. And And like we just don't give that same justification we don't give that same respect to like yeah. the food animals yeah. they're kind of like the last oppressed beings on the planet really. yeah. yeah allison says let's not ask people why they're not drinking i agree like don't ask questions that you might not be able to manage the answer to <laughs> have you ever thought about that before right great points here real talkers we hope we've planted a seed with you you can let us know what you think to talk at ryanjesperson.com coming up in 90 seconds what's happening with journalism in canada what does the future of journalism in canada look like this conversation is powered by our friends at park power who want to remind you that right now if you live in alberta and you're not signed up with park power i'm sorry you are paying more than you need to pay for your electricity, natural gas, and internet. It's that simple. You can go onto their website today, parkpower.ca, and compare rates on all three of those. And get this, with the new promo code, new for this year, we're thrilled to extend our partnership with this family-owned business. Real Talk 23, that's Real Talk 23, is the promo code you use. Your bundling power could save you up to $150 at parkpower.ca. When you sign up, you use the promo code Real Talk 23. Electricity, 50 bucks off your first bill. Natural gas, another 50 bucks off. Hey, you want to wrap internet into it and you don't need to be with the big guys. You're going to get the same internet with Park Power. That's another 50 bucks in your pocket check them out today at parkpower.ca you know they do great business with another partner of ours we love when this synergy happens of course i'm talking about kubi renewable energy they're western canada's largest full service contractor for residential and commercial solar power systems you can check out what they do at kubienergy.ca whether it's a dairy barn whether it's your off-grid property How cool are those? Maybe it's an EV charger. You're picking up a new electric vehicle. Uh, Maybe you're getting one of those new Ford Lightnings. I saw one the other day. The new, like, big half ton. Oh, my gosh. So cool. If you're installing a charger in your home, maybe you want a Tesla Powerwall that everybody's talking about. Kubi does them. You can get a quote today for free, obviously, at kubienergy.ca. And a big shout out to our friends at Eden Landscaping. I told you I met with Mike just the other day, and, and he is so proud of their problem solving. 
I'm going to be honest, I was giggling a little bit. I said, what do you want me to tell Real Talkers? He says, you tell them that if they've been running into problems that other landscape contractors can't solve, we'll solve it. I said, that's a bold statement. He said, I know. I love it. He's got a smile on his face because he loves what he does. There's no way you operate a family business for than 20 years earning return business and referrals if you don't love what you do. They are great listeners. They're not designing your yard for a magazine. They're designing it for you. They want your vision to come to life. You can get that conversation started today. So the shovels are in the ground. The minute it thaws, check out Eden Landscaping at landscapeedmonton.ca. Well, these are the gut punches that you get used to, quite frankly, when you're in this line of work. It doesn't mean that it sucks any less the more that it happens, but more media layoffs announced this week, including some personal friends of mine. We've invited them on the show, but they're they're taking a few minutes to gather themselves because because sometimes even though the industry landscape in this context, journalism can appear to be daunting and shrinking for that matter. You always hope that the bell will not toll for you. But it did for journalists that were employed by the uh, Overstory Media Group, otherwise known as OMG. It was Victoria's Capital Daily, one example of layoffs just the other day. It's not limited to that corporation. Obviously, we've seen layoffs with Post Media. We've seen newsrooms shrinking when it comes to, of course, broadcast television, radio, and uh, perhaps the biggest examples in print. So what's causing it? And what does the future of storytelling look like in Canada? How do we preserve the institution of journalism? Our next two guests have made it their work, and I'm grateful that they're bringing their expert voices to the show today. Aaron Miller is the CEO of IndieGraph. That's a network of small and startup community news outlets pooling tech, capital, audience, and revenue resources to accelerate their growth. Erin also founded The Discourse, where she led an award-winning journalism team and developed a successful business model for in-depth local news. Jen Hassam is the executive director of the Broadbent Institute and the publisher of Press Progress. We're grateful to have both of them joining us this morning. Thanks for making time for us. Aaron, uh, it seems like media layoffs uh, is a recurring headline and it sucks every single time we see it. How do you process it? And and when you see more people uh, heading back to freelancing or, or maybe finding themselves in an unemployment scenario, what does it make you think bigger picture? Sure. I mean, it's always sad to see layoffs. Um, it's always sad to see the cutbacks that are happening within community news organizations. Um, one of the reasons, and um, one of the reasons that my organization was founded, though, was in to recognize that as we're seeing the down, um, the decline of um, of more traditional models, where a local journalist is employed by a large newspaper chain. Um, we're also seeing lots of entrepreneurial journalists that are starting up their own independent outlets. Um, that was certainly my own story. I started within the mainstream media. I was working as an education reporter um, for um, uh, McLean's Magazine, the Global Mail, a few others. Um, and then really just saw that there was less and less education reporting happening within local communities, which is the information that you know people really need most to be able to take action and be informed about their education systems. And so that's why I started um, the discourse um, and, uh, and it was a group of journalists. So uh, IndieGraph's all about continuing to empower journalists to own and be accountable to their own communities. And as we're seeing layoffs, um, unfortunately it's a continuation of a trend that's been going on for a really long time, but we're also seeing this response um, and this emergence of uh, of new entrepreneurial activity, which I think is really exciting. Yeah, I mean, and 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 let's be honest, like whether it's technology or audience preference, or or whether whether it's uh, trends either locally mm-hmm. or internationally, uh, journalism's not on an island. I mean, a lot of industries are forced to evolve or change. Jen, how, how yeah. do you wrap your mind around the the bigger picture story and what we're talking about this morning? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a a model of of journalism that is is in decline, and it's part of it is because that we're seeing these really large monopolies who are owned by equity firms or venture capital firms contract uh, because of market forces. They rely on an advertising base solely, essentially, uh, because they've moved to a digital subscription model. I'm a weird millennial and I get a hard newspaper delivered to me 
Uh, but we're not all like that. We're not all news junkies who prefer the, the paper. And so as people have made these choices, they also haven't invested perhaps necessarily in the kind of digital models that do succeed. Um, and so I, I'm with, with Aaron as much as there is, we are seeing cutbacks and decline and it's horrible, horrible, don't support that. But we are seeing an entrepreneurial spirit where people are, are growing and trying to build their own. And in some that I'd like to sort of talk about a little bit later on in, in the show is the nonprofit model that is demonstrating some success. Um, and we also are seeing unionized, some of these digital first entities also are unionized and creating good, good journalism jobs. So it's not just the freelance landscape. So the National Observer, Vice Canada, Candleland, Overstory announced that there was a unionization effort there. And of course, Press Progress, we're a unionized um, outlet as well. And so these can be good jobs with, with benefits. So yeah, I mean, there this and this is. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, and we can go there right now. And and Aaron, maybe we'll, <laughs> maybe we'll pop back to you because I, I'd love to. I mean, let's ask the question. You you know, let's say you follow Post Media. I mean, you know, I started my career at, at that time. It was a Southern newspaper at the Calgary Herald, but mm-hmm. obviously that's one of the Post Media papers. And and you look at where these evolutions have gone, and, and the newsrooms have shrunk, and then there's been more. I'm not using the right word, but like syndicated content, and the newspapers were getting smaller, and the local stories were, were becoming coming less and less and then people were learning more about the layoffs and then Paul Godfrey's big bonuses and people were understanding more about the hedge funds that owned the papers and the the influence of the corporations so Aaron how much of this is about maybe failed business models and how much of it is about like where Canadians appetites are to support journalists because I think that those can be two different conversations for sure. And, and there's multiple factors in this, like I, I, um, definitely like shifts in, in audience behavior um, is a key part of it that has made the opportunity for um, new kinds of independent digital organizations to exist. Um, but yeah, this is definitely the failure of a business model um, and a structure, corporate structure, not the failure of journalism at all. And I think that's really important um, to say because in fact, um, demand for local journalism is much higher than it was um, even a decade ago. Um, 67% of people in North America look digitally for news about their own communities online every day. Um, and almost 20% of this is an American stat. It's a little lower in Canada, um, but still growing. Um, 19% of, of uh, Americans pay directly for digital news. So those are those are really interesting trends um, that are pointing to a new business model, a business model that is about bringing the content that's truly valuable to people where they need it um, and, uh, uh, and and serving those audiences directly rather um, so that they'll pay you directly for a product that's actually valuable rather than treating the audience themselves as the product that you're selling to advertisers. So I think there's some pretty key things there. Um, the other piece that you guys have both touched on, which I think is really important, um, is uh, is the idea of um, uh, how the hedge funds and and all of these different things and and is really one of uh, again one of the reasons that IndieGraph is is really um, uh, focused on empowering ownership. Like I really see this moment as being a great transformation of ownership of local news from uh, from being centrally owned by folks whose incentives are not aligned and interests are not aligned with the actual communities that journalism is intended to serve towards a model that can be truly truly community owned and keep those assets um, there and have the journalists like, I, I bet on journalists at the end of the day. Um, and I think that's, you know, the, the movements towards unionization is another, is another piece of that. Um, creating good jobs, creating good entrepreneurial opportunities, making this a field that um, is a good place to work is a key part of, I think is the most important part of it. And, and then I trust journalists because, you know, none of us get into this for making the big bucks, right? We get into it to make an impact. And I think that's um, that's what we really want to empower moving forward. I, I appreciate you. You touched on two things in the same sentence that I want to follow up on here. You said, it, you know, it's a it, it's a good place to work and people trust journalists. Mm. And, and I don't know if you would find consensus on both of those statements across the country. Mm. Uh, you know, our, our no, industry, no. I'm looking, right? And, and let me throw it right back to you because the trust in journalism right now, or, or let me say vitriol aimed at journalists is, is ramping up 
more than I think we've ever seen it before. And I fear that it's chasing away promising young talent, in particular women. A hundred percent. And I certainly did not mean to to um, suggest that right. journalism is currently a good place to work. Um, right. It is not. The You know, folks have come out, you know, that we often talk about at, at discourse media. We used to talk about um, our organization as rehab. Like it took people like 12 to 18 months just to like recover from their previous workplaces. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's where we need to. In- what I'm what I'm arguing for is that that's where we need to invest our energies is in making these jobs good. And and absolutely journalistic safety is so important. Um, people are getting attacked uh, online. And of course that disproportionately impacts journalists of color as well and women. Um, but, uh, but at the same time, I think um, what is, what is really interesting um, is that, uh, is that people are increasingly like, uh, yes, they're attacking journalists, but also we're seeing a trend towards, people are connecting with individual journalists and trusting their content as opposed to big brands. And um, some of the research um, from, you know, a couple of decades ago showed that really you trust the globe, you trust CBC. Um, We're now starting to see people connect with individuals. And I think that's a really interesting movement that we can leverage for positive impact. I wanted to give a shout out, by the way, to a good friend of this show, uh, Erica Ifill was was named alongside Sab Idzes and, and Rachel Gilmore on one of the 100 most influential people in media in the Hill Times. The context is unfortunate, and Erica's talked about it on the show. It's just the absolute poison, and, and quite frankly, the death threats that they've faced for for in, you know having a voice, having a, a strong presence on the Canadian media landscape. Jen, when you talk about that nonprofit element, or when you talk about different opportunities. Opportunities like like Aaron's laid out. I mean, how how much of a, a a shift does there have to be? Not just with the journalists themselves or the future journalists, potential talent, uh, but also the general population. Like, do, do Canadians do do thirty five or forty million of us need to rethink our our understanding, our relationship with storytellers, the priority that we place on integrity in storytelling, and and maybe quite frankly, how we support or pay for content. That's, you know, I think you nailed it. Um, you know, Aaron is uh, much more sophisticated than I and can probably say who said this, but there was a fantastic quote around, if you are not paying for the news, you're the product. Right. And what that means is that if you're not paying to read or to consume the news that you're consuming, you are probably being, your data is being captured and you are being sold as the audience to the, in a corporate entity that is looking to place ads and that is looking to reach an audience. And so that's, I think, a leap for people to think about is that they're a product in this pipeline of a, a, cor- a more corporate media entity. Whereas if we reconfigure that and we have, you know, I want the the models that I have worked with. um, And so it's at Press Progress. I've also seen uh, the launch of two other nonprofit um, media outlets. Uh, So shout out to Constellation Media Society and people in Quebec. And we we base it on on a subscription model coupled with ads. So that way we're not entirely reliant on a single advertiser or a couple advertisers. And uh, one of the, you know, at Constellation Media Society, we partnered with IndieGraph, who do work in terms of finding great community groups, great sponsors who want to uh, who want to reach a local community. Because Ryan, if you're a small business and you're trying to bring people into your restaurant, you're trying to bring people into the services that you sell or provide for a community. How are you going to reach that community in a in a really meaningful way? If all that's left for you is Google ads and Facebook ads, but the public just kind of ignores already anyways. So advertising in these good local digital outlets are, you know, do more than also like create really good viable media for people and information and factual information about what's happening in their community. But it's also good for business and creating a community and a place where people can sort of sell their products in a, in a really good kind of way. So mm-hmm. I think the nonprofit model works, but that is, but it doesn't work with large. I think that this kind of digital model doesn't generate a whole lot of, of profit. It doesn't, no one's becoming a millionaire off of this kind of <laughs> local 
<laughs> Aaron's giggling because she knows she knows what the margins are and that's why um I think the reason why I was added to the show is that I am suspect of venture capital who involve themselves in local digital media because the margins are so tight that I don't know if they can hold the kind of um create the kind of dividends that their investors are expecting from them. There's a great piece. Uh, Patricia Elliott wrote it for, for CBC Opinion. People can read it, cbc.ca, uh, out of Saskatchewan. The Canada's newspapers are being plundered by monopoly capitalism. And 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 you can argue, I mean, if you, if you do enough of a deep dive, I think a lot of people would be appalled to see what's happened to newspaper ownership across the yeah. country right now. Um Aaron, I want to ask you if you'd like to chime in on that, but also, uh, you know, oftentimes to, to pull back the curtain a little bit, we'll ask our guests ahead of time, is there anything that you really want to touch on? Is there anything that you really want to mention? And you let us know that you want to blow up Bill C-18. Uh, this is an act respecting online communications platforms that make news content available to persons in Canada. I really appreciate this because for so many people, we have short attention spans. There's only so much we can pay attention to. And I bet you there's a bunch of Canadians that, do give a damn that probably aren't paying really close attention to C-18. Can you take us into that? Sure. Um, and um, and actually, I maybe I shouldn't have used the phrase blow up, um, but that's what I was messaging you on my <laughs> Let, let me <laughs> say, phone, we'll take but... a scalpel to it. How about that? Is that better? Yeah, well, no, no. I mean, the truth of the matter is I, I have worked. I've, I've, there's a, a, a coalition of publishers that came together to push for some pretty significant changes and, and did achieve some important amendments to ensure that um, uh, that uh, uh, the that the bill is more equitable and, and will benefit more than just the large chain. So I was part of that movement, but I had to kind of do it with my nose plugged because mm -hmm. I really just think that the whole bill from the way that it's been designed um, uh, right down to it is is really problematic and just for folks who might not um might not know what c18 is it's a um it's a bill that is currently before the senate um that uh is attempting to uh to force um platforms specifically google and facebook will but it will um impact others um to compensate um news publishers directly for using content specifically links um, so, of course, like the idea would be that uh, it forces them into negotiation with um, with the pu with publishers um, and uh, to to come up with a fair price um, for them using links on on like Google search or Facebook, etc. If they fail to come to a negotiation, it forces it into arbitration. Um, and um, I have some major, major problems with this bill, because at the end of the day, uh, and, you know, we can get into all the minutia about how it impacts copyright law and really goes against some of the, the base principles of the open Internet. Um, but I think at the base, um, the thing that I, I want Canadians to know um, is this is essentially does not guarantee any money to support journalism. This guarantees another massive um, influx of cash to post media to these big companies that essentially their interest and I thought the article uh, the CBC article that you shared was just bang on on this um, you know these are hedge funds in the states that are trying to pay back debt that are trying to um, you know who are working um, to strip assets out of these community organizations so there's nothing in this bill that guarantees that this funding will actually go to supporting more journalism and as you can see even after the federal government's newspaper bailout that um, underwrites 25% of journalism labor. That's significant. After local journalism initiative, we still saw Post Media lay off 11% of its staff this week. This is slowing the transition. Um, it's benefiting the incumbents. It's benefiting these large corporate owned chains at um, disproportionately. And, and, you know, some of the smaller outlets do get crumbs. I don't want to say that they, you know, we've negotiated as hard as we can to try to include everyone. Um, but but I think we would be best served at this point by allowing um, the the model to to follow what's going to happen because of what's already happening because of these trends rather than sort of slow it down. And I know that that's not a popular idea because it does mean a lot of pain. It means a lot of layoffs. It means um, as we transition to something that's more sustainable. But ultimately, I see this transition that's happening, the disruption that's happening as a huge generational opportunity to transform that local news to better serve community and be more equitable and 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 put journalists who are better connected to their communities at the center of making the decisions rather than, 
you know, the um, the executives in offices or even in the case of Overstory Media, you know, I mean, that's not a large chain. No, the money behind that is a Victoria based person, um, Andrew Wilkinson, who came into this with the best of intentions. But at the end of the day, he's bringing his company public and he can't, you know, he had to make the decision that we're about um, that we're putting profit above everything else, not what was best for the community. So mm. even in that case, I think um, I think we, we it just shows more and more that we need to we need to support independent ecosystem to emerge, which will be much more robust um, than having these large chains that are taking value out and bringing them to to benefit shareholders in other countries. I totally agree. I, I, I fear that this next question for both of you is going to lack focus, but we're talking a lot about business models, and I want to invoke yes. a couple of different examples here, or maybe a couple of different pillars uh, that, that step outside of the business model, so to speak, but not totally. If you look at a lot of the a lot of the, lot of the, the negative comments and, and, a, and a lot of the sort of the, the I guess I'll call it hate that, that a lot of people can face that are working in this industry, a ton of it. And, and typically it comes from political opponents uh, to the current federal government or to the current prime minister. Uh, but people that have an ideological barrier between themselves and this federal government will oftentimes to journalists say, well, you and the 600 million, you on Trudeau's payroll, you and this government, you know, the government's bought and paid for the media. The liberals own the media. Uh, and then you look at the, the falling trust and we see it statistically and it's not limited to just journalism. Ironically, healthcare providers are seeing a drop in trust right now, which I think is absolutely bizarre coming through the pandemic. But, but I digress. There are, there, there are these sentiments that are, mm -hmm. th that are welling up on the cultural side. I mean, was, was the $600 million actually disadvantageous to the industry aside from, from maybe bailing out a couple smaller papers that needed it? I mean, how do you turn that, that trust trend around, Jen? Where, where do you think it needs to go on a cultural level? And is it possible to make that impact? Oh, boy. I know it's a big question, right? Where do I start right? I know, I know. So, um, look, I think there's, there's two things. There, I guess there's two things that I'd like to say. One is that Press Progress does do very political work. We are the guys who stand up to the big dogs. We do original investigative journalism, and there's no opinion pieces. And we're very public about it, there being no opinion pieces and it being investigative journalism only. And I think like that is something that our readership wants and needs. And we also have a readership that that is like for, I guess, for lack of a better term, working class. It's people who compared to the Canadian census um, are lower income and have a lower educational attainment than the rest of Canada and who disproportionately live outside of the major cities. And that is who we are trying to do original investigative reporting for. And so it's really interesting because despite the very hot topics that we take on and we, we do not hold our punches against those with power. Um, when we do audience surveys, and we'll have thousands and thousands and thousands of, of people who enter, so it's cross-cutting a broad range of political perspectives, because we do ask, you know, what are your, your ideological leanings? And it's across the board, for, and this is press progress, like the three of us, we understand, we understand who people think we are, but that's our, our readership, and I think that people are, who are our readers want to have something that is truth first and doesn't have we don't do hot takes we don't do op-eds we don't do opinions stuff like that um and there's there's definitely a market for people who are readers of this and who want to support it you know on a monthly sort of digital subscription basis um i guess i'll also say like in the local news column which is something that is completely different um there's uh there's also i think like a really good democratic element here whereby if you do create a community where you know what's happening in your community it reduces isolation and feelings of isolation and increases feelings of unity and community then that's also a way in which to diminish i guess the sort of big time alienation that can drive people into being so i guess like aggressive versus journalists and and the people who do local journalism they lead with themselves. 
They like they are themselves in their articles, in the emails that they write, in how they present themselves online. And so they build trust. And so, you know, while there is this narrative and it is very real and the journalists that as a publisher I manage and I'm responsible for every day, they do feel it, especially when they touch on hot, hot topics. There's no question. Mm. But at the same time, the work that they are doing is very high trust when we, when we ask our readership. And, um, and we do believe that this work is creating the, the, the inklings of, of a, a democratic engagement and, and community. Mm. Aaron? Yeah, I mean, I, I do really agree with that. And um, uh, that really, I think that the, the culture change that needs to happen is at the community local level, and it's going to happen conversation to conversation. The publishers that we have the opportunity to work with, a lot of them are, you know, they're serving a geographic community, but they're, um, and they might be amplifying particular communities that have been ignored. Uh, traditionally, or like making efforts to to reach out to that community or connected to it themselves, um, but really they're trying to serve everybody in the community. And and we often talk about table setting journalism, like leading with facts, being open. Um, you know, not pretending that objectivity is some ideal, but instead it's a tool that we use. And being open about where we're coming from as humans and what our biases might be, um, and then and then inviting people in to have a conversation and building bridges between different groups. Um, some of the work that I'm really inspired by, you know, we've been working, uh, IndieGraph, about 60% of our publishers, um, we've worked with um, over 85 publishers in the last two and a half years, about 60% of them are in the US where some of these issues around trust and polarization of politics are so extreme. And the work that really inspires me for one example is, um, is Shasta Scout in Northern California in a region in Shasta County that, um, is connected to, um, you know, the, some even militias and, and the Bethel Church is like very, very involved in, in the municipal government. Um, and there's also uh, an emerging Indigenous community that has been very overlooked. And it, there's just like some really interesting conversations happening. And these journalists are, are able to play a really important role bringing people together to have conversations that they wouldn't otherwise have. So that's what I'm really interested in. And um, and I think that local news, all, I mean, again, I keep throwing to the research, but um, uh, yeah, the research has shown that like as our um, news consumption shifts from local to national and international, the more national and international that we read, the more isolated we feel um, all of that. Um, folks who don't have access to quality local news are less likely to even trust their neighbors, run for office, volunteer. Um, so really rebuilding that ecosystem is a key part of the cultural change and, and um, uh, that, yeah, it's just a key part of the cultural change that needs to happen in my view. I'm, I'm so grateful for both of your time. I don't want to overstep. We've, we've, we've asked you for a limited window and I know you got lots on your plate, but I, I want to ask for a couple of closing thoughts. And Jen, by the way, uh, I know you have a closing thought, but before you go, I also have to ask you about your piece on Pierre Polyev and how he's not Trump. So, so leave me, yeah, at, leave me sure. at least 60 seconds for that because John Ibbotson, uh, by the way, <laughs> says that he does. He's, <laughs> I know. I love it. John says, I don't always agree with Hassam. He says, but this is a really smart take. So I have to ask you about that. But, but let me ask you both for, for just one wrap up thought on this so we don't leave anything on the table before we transition out mm -hmm. jen sure so i'll i'll say that this is not necessarily a brand new news model the kind of news that you know the the outlets that i work with or the outlets that aaron works with and i brought a book i brought a prop uh if stone he <laughs> is one of the original uh investigative journalists who are independent and he ventured out on his own to create um, a weekly newsletter. So it's almost the same as, as a digital weekly email newsletter in which he would observe the goings on of in Washington, DC. And he broke major news stories, major, major big news stories. And by the end of his career, he had 50,000 subscribers uh, and was very well respected. So uh, for us at Press Progress, he's someone who uh, whose model we look up to when we think about fierce independent investigative journalists who really go after the powers that be. I love that. And shame on me for not knowing enough about IF Stone. I'm going to Google as soon as we're done this. I'm going to go. Do it. There's a I, whole documentary. Uh, yeah, I'll make you that commitment. I'm going to watch that before the week's out. Aaron, one closing thought. Yeah, uh, you know, if Jen's looking to the past, I'll look to the future a little bit. Um, 
I do think, again, we're not reinvent. We don't need to reinvent something um, from scratch. Like the sorts of trends that are hitting um, news have hit other industries and there's so much to learn from other industries. I think sometimes we can get a little bit insular and um, uh, in the journalism industry. And so we're really looking at the disruption of other content and um, the music industry is one um, that jumps out to me. Like, you know, a decade ago, um, the, the previous model was, you know, only like a small number of people who were the big celebrities would be able to um, afford to be recording artists and and get that music um, to folks. And all of that with lots of pain was disrupted through the Internet. But now we have a scenario where there's like a middle class of recording artists who are creating all sorts of new kinds of music and reaching audiences with more niche music and able to make a living. And um, anyway, so we're trying to learn from some of the tech technology um, uh, disruptions. And obviously there's been lots of unintended negative consequences too. So how can we do it better? Um, and how can we we learn from other industries and, and take the best of, of technology as well as resisting some of the negative stuff? I love it. Um, in closing, Jen, let me just ask you real quick. I, 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 I didn't tell you I wanted to ask you about <laughs> politics, but hey, you, you, you put it out in newspapers across the country, so I suspect you won't mind laying out for us why you say Pierre Polyev is filling a void that the left should occupy. You, you argue in, in a piece, like I said, that, that John Ibbotson, a conservative columnist, said is, is really smart, a really smart take. You say that if people treat Pierre Polyev like he's Trump, the left, the progressive voters, so to speak, are going to lose the next federal election. What's the argument? Yeah, I mean, I don't get to write the headlines of pieces I submit to um, to news outlets. But an alternative one would be that Pierre Polyev is coming after your voters. And and that's why um, he, he clearly has a strategy for younger voters, indigenous voters, racialized voters. And that is quite different from the Trump playbook. The Trump play playbook sought to um, increase voter turnout amongst white, more rural, um, and more affluent voters. That was his voter base that he needed to increase and motivate a turnout for. And what Pierre's like strategy is, in my humble opinion, but it was widely read and conservatives said, yes, <laughs> this is indeed what's happening, is that he just needs a cup, the Conservative Party uh, federally just need a couple of percentage points in order to win a uh, win government, perhaps even win a majority. And so the place where he's looking to gain those percentage points are amongst young people, racialized people and indigenous people. And so I laid out in that Ottawa Citizen article what I think he's doing and that the good news is that for progressives is that we're we have really good, strong ideas on how to make housing affordable on how to fight the cost of living and combat greedflation and how we can also just create good jobs because with a looming recession that's going to suddenly become top of mind as well so you know i think like that's who that's the strategy that he's playing out but there's also solutions for progressives who need to combat um, and defend this voter base. It's a strong take, and I'm grateful that you took us into it. That's uh, Jen Hassam, who's the executive director of the Broadband Institute. She's the publisher at Press Progress. Aaron Miller is the CEO of IndieGraph. She also contributed to founding Press Forward, an association of independent Canadian publishers, and C4C Canada, which is a charity dedicated to amplifying underrepresented voices. So wonderful to have you both on Real Talk. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Ryan. You bet. You can follow those two on Twitter. Uh, again, just check out Real Talk RJ. Thanks to everybody that follows us there on our official account, and, and you can make that connection there. Uh, I saw a comment here from Justin, and, and there's good balance to the comment. I'll be honest, Justin, I, I bristled a tiny little bit when I saw the first half of the comment uh, because it's something that, to be honest, drives me nuts. Uh, but then I thought you brought good balance in your follow-up, pal. And he says, I think that a problem with good journalism these days is that a lot of it is behind a paywall. And with everybody nickel and diming me, uh, it's too bad that important journalism is hidden a lot. And then he says, but at the same time, there does need to be support for the publications. The problem is that the ones that get amplified don't paywall and they can spread misinformation. Hmm. So there's some good points there, but and, and, and I don't mean to be sort of dismissive in my comment because I think Justin covered it, but, but without paywalls or without pay to play or without subscriptions or without advertising for that matter. Mm -hmm. I know some people think that advertising is annoying, but like 
how do you think people keep the lights on? I, I mean, li- it, it seems to me to be so obvious. Like, how do you, how do you think you pay for studio space? How do you think you buy cameras? How do you think you pay your staff? You know, I mean, I understand that inf- information is important. And when there are things that are in the, the, the public interest, for example, that, you know, the federal government or the provincial government is saying this. I mean, you think in the, in, in the height, and, I'm, and not in a good way, in the height of the pandemic, mm-hmm. like when, when things were, were absolutely bonkers. And I know we're not out of it yet, but you know what I'm saying? Um, a lot of uh, publications or a lot of news outlets were lifting paywalls or putting stuff outside of the paywalls to make sure that the public had that health information that yeah, they needed. When it's really important. But it's still a business. Yeah. I, I There's two things like I, I never bitch about paying for, and that's music and or art and the news, because like wh- how else do we get it? Yeah. Without ads. So when I see ads on news sites, I do I don't get annoyed with them, you know? Justin is right though. I mean a lot of these so-called outlets, I don't even want to call them that. I mean a lot of people, you know, use the word news pretty loosey-goosey in their own names. Uh, you're right. When those ones are readily available and out there and easy to share, then they get shared a lot and they mm-hmm. may not be credible sources. Right. And uh, so that's a great point. I hope that this got you thinking. You can let us know where you're at by shooting us a note to talk at RyanJesperson.com. It's probably also a great time to remind you that Real Talk does have a Patreon that if you want to go above and beyond, I mean, aside from subscribing to the show and supporting us and downloading our podcast or, or streaming us on YouTube, which we appreciate more than you could ever know. If you want to take it to the next level, you can find our Patreon link. Just go to the connect link at RyanJesperson.com. And there's a ton of benefits uh, for our Patreon supporters including today advanced pre-sale access to our real talk cask to Woo-wee. maple bourbon and an invitation to an exclusive whiskey tasting and event that's coming up on thursday february 9th hosted by me and our friends at pws imports in edmonton if you do support real talk on patreon check your email inbox you're going to have that before two o'clock this <laughs> afternoon and we hope to see you there. And it's not too late to sign up, by the way. I mean, you could sign up on, on February 8th yeah. and you could attend February, that event. February, I believe. February. Can, can we tell them we, Feb- had, a, we had a tasting we, yesterday? We did have a tasting yesterday. I didn't, what did I didn't you think know if we were it? allowed to. Th- it was <laughs> ridiculous, right? If, if you liked the first one, this one is it's miles. So ahead. our first one was our first one is just different. It's just different. It was, it's it was not, called yeah. it was it was called it was a corn whiskey finished as a bourbon called Sweet Olathe Corn. Um, and if you want to go back in our archives, you can see my interview with William H Macy, who owns or is one of the owners uh, in that distillery. Of course, that we were so proud to work with out of Colorado last year. This one is with just, Broken Barrel Distillery out of California. Yeah. It's a maple bourbon, and it's one of the smoothest bourbons I've ever tasted. I feel in my like life. It, the masses. You know what I mean? It's yeah. gonna. You know, a lot of people are going to love this one. Yeah. So we'll officially launch that bourbon. If it doesn't sell out to our Patreon, we'll officially launch it next week here on the show. But again, Patreon supporters will have advanced access there. It's obviously a perfect time to talk about the folks that support Real Talk. That includes our friends at Tourism Jasper, who give us a chance every Wednesday to forget about all of the things, the distractions around us, to sometimes forget about the, the real life that can that can act like a, a punch in the gut or the news stories, the serious stuff, and and refocus and recharge. And, uh, well, there's no better place to do it than Jasper. It's My Jasper Memories, presented by Tourism Jasper. And this week, on the, on the heels of an incredible Jasper in January... Uh, Everybody that was out there, oh my gosh, right? What a time of year to be out there. I told you about my Jasper memories a couple of Wednesdays ago. You can go back in our archives if you want to see some of the photos, including a platter of Eggs Benedict that I know a lot of people were really into. (laughs) Well, welcome to February. For being the shortest month of the year, it can sure feel like a long one, right? At home, you know, the the, the temperature's cold, you're still scraping your windshield, you got to be dragging your ass and shoveling the walks and uh is it spring already well how do you lighten up what some people might call dreaduary there's a pronunciation for you here are some of jasper's best self-care practices and tips nothing beats a winter hot tub fresh air while you're toasty warm Hey, you know what I love about the Jasper hot tub experience, Johnny? You, you know, if it's cold enough, you, your hair is wet, and then it freezes into the icicles, and then you can plunge back under the water, mm. get back up, let it freeze again. Maybe you have a hot apple cider in there. Whatever you're feeling, whatever's yeah. in your coffee mug, you know what I'm talking about. 
anybody else hop out of the hot tub like I do, like our little guy Wyatt doesn't do snow angels, and then get jump back in to feel that burn? Well, Jasper's got multiple hotels with outdoor hot tubs. You can read all about them at jasper.travel, including, of course, the Fairmont Jasper Park Lodge. Also has a heated outdoor pool and amazing views over Lac Beauvair. Uh, you know you're in your happy place at the Fairmont JPL when you can hear that flagpole moving in the breeze. That little ding, ding, ding. You know what I'm talking about. There's Mount Robson Inn's hot tub, which has views over Whistler's Mountain. Stunning. Whistler's Inn has a rooftop hot tub, which is the coolest. And then there's Marmot Lodge and the Tonquin Hotel that have outdoor hot tubs as well. Why not treat yourself to a spa treatment while you're out there? Why not, why not, why not treat yourself like you deserve to be treated? Uh, pamper yourself at the Fairmont Spa, which has three different deluxe packages, special for February, perfect for a Valentine's weekend away. You're welcome for the idea. And then, of course, there's yoga and wellness as well. Jasper Wellness has a range of services to calm, including reflexology, massage, yoga teacher training, and more. You can make your own plan. You can forge your own Jasper memories by checking out their website right now, jasper.travel. From here, the greatest personal expeditions begin. Check out jasper.travel. And when you're out there making your own Jasper memories, we'd love to see your Instagram or Twitter posts with the hashtags MyJasper and RealTalkRJ. You can see them featured on a future episode of My Jasper Memories presented by Tourism Jasper. Uh, well, how are we supposed to go on with our day now after talking about spas and hot tubs and we don't apple we get ciders. out of here we get out of here <laughs> real talk tomorrow Let's go real talk tomorrow <laughs> from Jasper we do need to we keep talking about that road trip we need to make that happen I wanted to read this email from uh, Cameron this was really great yesterday we spent some time talking in kind words from Charles Adler by the way about yesterday's show if you follow him on Twitter I really appreciate that every once in a while we're gonna have a show where we, we just talk about what's on our mind and we just kind of let it free flow and we invite you to join us in that conversation and that was the case yesterday prompted by the passing of Bobby Hall and his his complicated legacy on one hand one of the greatest athletes of all time uh, in the sport of hockey one of the greatest goal scorers of all time uh, and, and on the flip side a guy that left a lot to be desired to say the least in his personal life and some of his public statements and the way that he uh, treated you know people closest to him including his spouses. Uh, a difficult conversation, but if the show's called Real Talk, it's what you expect, right? So Cameron wrote in, and he said yesterday, uh, he said your, your comments yesterday made me re-listen to Charles's segment from Monday. Cameron, we appreciate that. And he says, and I hope you can tell Chuck. Well, he'll be listening, Cam, so here you go. I appreciate the honesty that he showed. And I hope that he speaks to his values more often, as this is the real talk we want I mean, you know, TLDR, Cole's notes, Charles Adler basically said that polarization and a, and a desire to stay conflict free prompted him to, to essentially put some stuff out there publicly that he didn't necessarily 100 percent feel strongly about or even believe in. It was like a truth telling time. It was like confession on Monday and it blew my doors off. I wasn't expecting it. It was powerful stuff. Charles is with us every Monday. Cameron says society is ever evolving and we, we will always and we should continue to talk about any topic or issue as they present an opportunity for us to learn and reflect. He says the story about Ivan Provorov and the Flyers and, and the Pride Night allowed us to pause and reflect on where we are with regards to hockey inclusivity. You know, there's still work to be done, but would we have talked about the Washington Capitals not having a Pride Night without the Provorov story? He says, I don't blame Provorov for believing what he believes. You know, the propaganda you hear out of Russia, the stories about, you know, uh, how, how Russia piles on its own population, how easy it is for us to judge when deep down we really don't know what it's like to live a certain other way where we can express our thoughts here conveniently without, I don't know, going to jail. He says, I've, I've heard guests on Real Talk in past talking about how as humans we're, we're actually poor debaters. And the thing that I've taken from those interviews is that we need to be better and try to understand why people think the way they think. Yeah. He says if we ask why, maybe it gives us an opportunity to make somebody else pause and think as well. I wonder what conversations were had amongst Provorov's teammates in the Flyers dressing room. He says, I bet you it wasn't a topic prior to that. Society is ever evolving and sometimes it's slow. And people can be slow to change. And it's the reason why we need to continue to talk about issues no matter how many times we do. And while it's clear that 
things are you know that are acceptable 60 years ago are not acceptable now that's only one generation you know for me that would be my parents that would have been an influence on my beliefs cam says i continue to look forward to all your episodes and tough conversations to be had both on the show and within ourselves wow i love it thanks cameron i know it's only february 1st but we're going to put that in the pile for consideration of our email of the month every month somebody wins a real talk studio issue mug and we'll announce the winner of that tomorrow real talk doesn't happen without sponsors like grand dog essentials quality raw food i'm going to tell you something our lab johnny monroe three years old labs are supposed to eat anything Mm -hmm. the whole problem with labs is that if you don't train them properly they're going to eat the steak right off your plate (laughs) labs are going to tear up your garden labs are going to get into the carrots labs are going to eat your shoes labs love to eat but guess what monroe's not eating and we can't figure it out why. We can't figure out what's changed with Monroe's. You want to know what it's like to do business with Grand Dog Essentials Quality Raw Food? Amanda, one of the family members, one of the Monsmas, they own this company. They operate this company so proudly. She's working with us one-on-one, like continuing correspondence to help us figure out what's happening. We're adjusting her diet. We're trying new things. We're integrating elements on, on products that, that Grand Dog doesn't have on their web. Website. That's how much they care about the well-being of our furry family members. It's why we are so proud uh, to partner with Grand Dog Essentials. It's why we were customers of Grand Dog Essentials before we were doing business with them. This is a strong testimonial because we love our family members. We love our dogs like they're our kids, right? At Grand Dog Essentials Quality Raw Food, you can check out their blog. For more information on introducing high-quality protein on both your dog and cat's diets, And don't forget, when you place your order for delivery to your door in Calgary, Edmonton, or Central Alberta, the promo code REALTALK knocks 10% off your first-time order at granddog.ca. At Local Environmental Services, they're about so much more than garbage and recycling. Uh, Maybe you're a restaurateur that's paying way too much. A buddy told me the other day he's paying almost $1,000 a month for a front-load bin behind his restaurant. A 1000 bucks a month. It's tough for him, right? Especially when times are more challenging than ever before in his specific industry. I said to him, pal, I'm sorry to hear it, but have you checked out localenvironmental.ca yet? He said, I know. He said, I think I got to do that today. So he's going to request his quote and find out how he can pay less. Uh, Maybe you got a bigger business you're doing. Maybe you're going to be tearing off the siding on your house or re-roofing your pad in the next couple of months. They've got those big roll-off bins as well. Of course, they've also got water hauling and vacuum trucks and landfill services and portable toilets. And, well, you get the idea. Local Environmental Services is all about serving the communities where they live and work. That's White Court, Northern Alberta area, Edmonton and area, and, of course, into Saskatchewan as well, in particular around Regina. If you're in the prairies and you're into saving money and dealing with a family-owned business, we recommend Local Environmental Services. And, Johnny, it is my absolute honor to announce that as of eight o'clock this morning the real talk pond hockey classic is sold out wow we are sold out and that's good news as well because we have exact numbers for our friends at the dairy queens of northwest edmonton and sherwood park they're going to know approximately now how many burgers they got to bring how many ice cream treats they got to bring this is a family-owned business the dairy queens in palisades nemeo newcastle westmount and Baseline Road that have supported this charity fundraiser for years. And I'm really excited to introduce those family members, the Cardinals, the Liebers, to those of you that are going to join us in St. Albert coming up on Saturday, the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. Looking forward to that, my man. Mm -hmm. Looking forward to it. We've just received confirmation uh, from her office that uh, former Alberta Premier, leader of Alberta's official opposition, Rachel Notley, is going to join us tomorrow. I'm looking forward to that conversation. If you have a question uh, that you would like her to answer, you can send it in to us for consideration to talk at ryanjesperson.com or you know where to find us on social media. We always love the different angles when you let us know what's on your radar and what's important to you. Plus, the Magazine Club, our Real Talk Roundtable on Friday presented by Urban Timber. How do we change the gender dynamic in the boardrooms? Make it a great day, friends.
Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson, Executive Producer Josh Dunford, Technical Producer John Hicks, General Manager Katie Cook Chivers, Account Coordinator Lawrence Durlego, Human Resources Lena Shepard, Website Design Mike Johnston, Voiceover by me, Carrie Skelton. Real Talk's editorial board is Sapria Duvetti, Ahmed Ali, Brandy Morin, Ann Castleman, Corey Hogan, Harmon Candola, Catherine O'Neill, and Chris Henderson. Member Emerita, Julie Rohr. Real Talk is recorded in Edmonton, Alberta on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional and ancestral territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Soto, and Nakota Sioux, home to the Métis settlements and the Métis Nation of Alberta. Real Talk is a relay project. For more, check out ryanjasperson.com.